whosoever hates his brother is a murderer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. The very essence of perfection consists in charity. And the essence of charity is devoutness, this firm determination one has of the will to give itself up to God. And if need be, to make the entire sacrifice of self to Him and His glory, preferring His good pleasure to that of self and others. You shall love your God above all things and your neighbor as yourself, as yourself, image, likeness, and reflection of God. With due proportion, the same can be said of our neighbor. It is God whom we love, obviously, in our neighbor, likeness, and reflection of God's perfection, wishing his or her eternal beatitude. This is the way of perfection which we have to follow. Love of our neighbor becomes therefore not only a meritorious attitude, but a necessary good work for heaven. And this is why St. John could say, If any man say, I love God, but hates his brother, he is a liar. And today we are warned once again not to betray the call to perfection we have received through our baptism. We generally affirm that man has three lives. The first life, the spiritual life, the life of the soul, which is injured by sin when we commit a venial sin, or even grave sins, obviously, when we lose that spiritual life. The second life is the temporal life, the life of the body, injured by wounds, illness, diseases. And finally, the civil life, the life of good fame, injured by unbridled tongues. Sin, as we said, deprives us of the first life, the spiritual life, by depriving us of that sanctifying grace, life of God in our soul, the very principle of life in our soul. The second, death, deprives us of that second life, the physical life. And finally, slander deprives us of the third life. So if we take so much care to save and to protect our life or the life of our neighbor in fighting against the sting of sin, if we are especially today so careful about preserving our temporal life or the life of others and the care we give to our bodies, to our health, to our appearance, why then, why then is there so little efforts made to protect to defend or to restore our civil life of good fame, of the good fame, the good reputation of our neighbor. Man has two ears and only one tongue. The former ever open and the second and closed. Talkativeness is a sign of foolishness, whereas silence, as we too often know, Silence is a sign of wisdom. St. James wrote in one of his epistles, If anyone deludes himself, in his epistle, if anyone deludes himself by thinking he is serving God when he has not learned to control, to bridle his tongue, the service he gives is vain. Two particular weapons have proven to be quite efficient in the hands of the evil one, to divide, to break, to destroy, to beget dislike, or even hatred, detraction, and calumny. Detraction, in making known without cause the secret faults of another. And be careful here, make no mistake, this sin is not as common, I think, as calumny itself. Since too often, one lacks of the true knowledge of the secret fault of another to be able to be right and truthful in our severe and uncharitable judgment on a particular fault, easily misleading away from the truth 
but easily leading us to the sin of calumny now. So calumny, which is this imputation of a sin, or faults, or even crimes, crimes understood here in its widest meaning, imputing these crimes, these faults, to another, but untruly. So let us be coherent with ourselves. Let us ban from our midst the spirit of division, pointing fingers to each other in a tireless effort to simply excuse ourselves from our own mistakes and weaknesses. How can one pretend to defend the life of the unborn, especially today, most praiseworthy cause, when we did not protect the life and the good reputation of our direct, most proximate neighbor? The defense of life begins at the conception and continues at all the stages of human life. Our consistent efforts and sacrifices on refraining our ears from listening to that evil poison of slander, detraction, or calumny, filtering with prudence and wisdom before accepting as true everything and anything out there, refraining our tongue from speaking ill of others, applying to the fury of our passions the balm of patience and reserve. All these efforts I'm sure will give grounds to a true Christian civilization. If I should deliver my body to be burned and have not charity, it profits me nothing. St. Francis de Sales sees these two sins, calumny and detraction, as one and the same poison that easily spreads and kills the reputation, the good name of one another. Whosoever hates his brother is a murderer. Slender is a kind of murder according to the same saint, St. Francis de Sales. As he explains, the slanderer commits three several murders with his idle tongue. He destroys his own soul and that of him who hearkens, as well as causing the death to the object of his slander. For as St. Bernard says, the devil has possession both of the slanderer and of those who listen to him, of the tongue of the one and the ears of the other. Both calumny and detraction are directly opposed not only to the virtue of charity, but also to the virtue of justice, to charity first in doing an act of hatred or at least of dislike, exposing a neighbor to ridicule of contempt, causing him or her pain, suffering, should it one day reach his or her ears. And experience, as we all know, experience shows too often that it most of the time ends up reaching his or her ears or showing complete absence of Christian feeling. Jealousy, envy, easily turn into that form of hatred and dislike, leading to sins of the tongue. Opposed to justice now, robbing another of the esteem he has the right to enjoy, exposing him to maybe some temporal losses, material, sentimental, affective, social losses, maybe even endangering another's temporal prospects. The gravity of these two sins, detraction and calumny, will obviously vary according to the imputation made, the injury effected or intended, the number of, per of people hearing the slanderer, and finally the degree of authority or influence of the victim. So as we begin this beautiful month of June dedicated to the most sacred hearts of our Lord, meek and humble. Let us take the firm resolution to follow our good Lord's example in times of temptation or persecution. Meekness and humility. Meek and humble. He remained silent, or at least reserved, prudent, meek. 
before the sins of the repentant Mary Magdalene, before the lack of faith of the apostles, before the betrayal of Judas, before his own executioners, before the betrayal of St. Peter, before the incredulity of Thomas after his resurrection. So let us ask the Holy Spirit to increase in us the gifts of wisdom, understanding, counsel, and knowledge especially, to persevere and grow in charity. Let us beg for the grace to continue our efforts, guided and lighted by the virtue of prudence, that knowledge of what to seek and what to avoid. For the greater, greater glory of God and the salvation of many souls, and indeed, St. Francis de Sales says, Who can say how many more virtues claim a place in this bright choir? Prudence, gentleness, modesty of speech, and many another circle around their queen, Holy Charity, who is indeed the life of all of them. Charity which bids us bless those who curse us, and pray for those who persecute us. And this same charity not frequently transforms our persecutors into protectors and change slanderers' tongues into trumpets to sound our praise. Most sacred heart of Jesus, have mercy on us. Jesus, meek and humble of hearts, make my heart like unto thine. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, Amen.